Thank you for joining ACES Connection, Starting and Growing Resilient Communities, Session 2, Organizing Your ACES Initiative. This is Ingrid Cochran. I'm the Tennessee and Midwest Community Facilitator. And this is Session 2. Our panelists today are going to be myself, Karen Klimmer, the Northern California and Northwest Community Facilitator, and Laura Kane the Southern California Community Facilitator. I'd like to take this time to ask all of you who are not currently uh, ACES Connection members to please join us at acesconnection.com. First, some housekeeping. There's no need to raise your hand. Please use the Q&A icon for any questions. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation also, this session is going to be recorded and will be available for future viewing. Any questions or concerns that are not addressed during this webinar will be answered via acesconnection.com. So first, let me tell you a little bit about ACES Connection. Um, the purpose of ACES Connection is to support communities to accelerate ACES science and solve our most intractable problems. ACES Connection is a social network that recognizes the impact of a wide variety of adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, in shaping adult behavior and health, and that promotes trauma-informed and resilience-building practices and policies in all families, organizations, systems, and communities. Um, it's sometimes called the Facebook of the ACEs movement, um, it was launched in 2012 by our founder, Jane Stevens, a health science and technology journalist who realized the need to educate the public about ACES science and to create a social network for people interested in this newly emerging field. Over the last six years, membership has grown to over 25,000 people from more than 40 countries. Um, right now we have about 150 um, online initiatives and we also have um, our funding comes from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the California Endowment so that all of our tools, resources, and supports can be free to ACES Connection members. I'd like to get started with the call to action. We are wanting all of our members to be either be involved in a community or to start their own community. Here you'll see a map of all of the different ACEs um, connection online communities that we have. Our goal is to get to 300 communities by the end of March. So again, if you are interested in starting your own community, uh, please reach out to us. I will make sure that I connect you with the contact information for your regional facilitator at the end of this webinar. So here's our agenda for today. We'll have a quick series overview, then we'll discuss mission and value statements, creating norms, strategic planning, and tips for organizing an initiative. So let's start with our series overview. Last month, we talked about just the overall series and we introduced you to the members of our staff as well as the site itself. And we did some site navigation um, this month, we're going to talk about organizing your ACEs initiative. Um, so we'll focus more on the groundwork to get started. Next month, we'll be talking about launching an ACEs initiative. Coming in April, we'll talk about becoming trauma informed. In May, we'll discuss how to tell your community story. And then in June, we'll discuss developing leadership within your initiative. All sessions after June will be announced at a later date. So first, let's discuss mission and value statements. As we said last month, this webinar series is framed around Growing Resilient Communities 2.0. So let's talk about that um, body of work that we have on the site. 
So I'm going to navigate to the site and we'll show you where you can find information in the site itself. So this is the home page. When you log in, well, you should definitely log in. You can see your icon in the side. If you're not logged in, you may not be able to access all of the features of the site. So be sure to log in when you first come on. From the home page, you really just need to scroll down and you'll find GRC 2.0 here on the right of the screen. So here you will find all of the data that we've stored that has been labeled as Growing Resilient Communities 2.0. And there are a lot of different resources here. So today we're gonna to go into Organizing Your ACES Initiative, which is a post that was put up by our community lead, Gail Kennedy. In this post, you'll find plenty of links to get started. Um, today we're gonna to focus on mission and vision statements. And here you'll find Alicia Doctor, another ACES Connection staff member, has put up a post for some samples. So you have Maine Resilience Building Network, the National Collaborative on Adversity and Resilience, and Walla Walla Washington uh, Children's Resilience Initiative. And here are their mission statements. So whenever you get ready to start your own mission statement, this is the place to go to get some samples. Um, this is a very good resource, not just for mission statements, but we'll also talk about vision statements as well. When it comes to mission statements, you want to make sure that that statement is saying what your initiative plans to do and how. Why does your initiative exist? And who does your initiative serve? So here is the American Red Cross mission statement. To prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. So this mission statement clearly um, highlights who they serve and how they do it. Now we'll move to vision statements. So we'll go back to Gail's post. And now we want to look at vision statements. This highlights another post from Alicia that shows vision statements from the National Collaborative on Adversity and Resilience and Walla Walla Washington. Vision statements are different from mission statements in that vision statements show the big picture. Um, they show the future that the organization or initiative wants to bring about. So when we're looking at value and vision statements, what does your initiative envision for the future? What is the big picture? And what does your initiative aim to accomplish? And so here's the Alzheimer's Association vision statement, a world without Alzheimer's disease. A lot of times people can get a little wordy in their mission and vision statements and value statements. Um, sometimes it's good to have a very clear, concise, short vision statement. It can be very powerful. Mm -hmm. 
so now we're going to talk about creating norms. For this one, I just wanted to share a document that we created for my committee with ACE Nashville, which is a collective impact in Nashville, Tennessee. This is just an agenda from one of our uh, committee meetings. It has our vision and our mission. So Nashville is a safe, stable, and nurturing community for all is our vision. And then our mission statement is that we um, prevent and mitigate the lifelong impact of childhood adversity to improve safety, prosperity, and health of our community. And then for my community specifically, we're looking to empower parents and families to promote resilience and prevent ACEs. And so here in every agenda that I put out every month, I include what is really our norms collective effort, transparency, commitment to building trauma-sensitive systems, measuring impact and learning from results, civility and respect for all voices, and a fierce commitment to solutions. So this is setting the tone for every meeting. At the beginning of every meeting, I read those core values, and this creates the norm for our interactions for that meeting. When we are thinking about creating norms, um, norms are really our rules of engagement, our operating norms, code of conduct, and can even be bylaws, which are really just regulations for our members. When you create norms, they should align with your goals. They should also allow all members to participate and they should increase productivity and effectiveness and they should also increase efficiency. So I've given some other examples of norms for a meeting. You can have norms for your organization as a whole, but then you should also have norms for each time that you um, are in a space together and working towards a goal. So let's say you have a monthly meeting or you're doing a meeting for a strategic plan you should create norms for every interaction. Um, it's always good to do kind of a round robin and let everyone be involved in creating the norms. Um, and then once you have created these norms, every meeting and every space, you should revisit your norms to kind of set the tone for the meeting. So these, are, these examples are very basic norms. So respect one another, all voices should be heard, no triangulation, which really just means no gossiping, or not having the meeting after the meeting and not including everyone in, in that discussion. And then no assumptions, so ask for clarification. Um, and this is, I included that one because it's very important to not make assumptions or to not um, read into what someone else says. Always ask for clarification so that you're very clear. This allows for transparency and once you make assumptions and you fill in the gaps for yourself, you may be incorrect and may be operating under um, a misinformed stance. So it's very important to ask for clarification. And so these are the types of norms that you want to have at every meeting um, and every event so that you are setting the tone for your interaction. So next, we'll have strategic planning. Strategic planning is going to be covered by our very own Karen Klimmer. Thank you, Ingrid. And thank you for everybody for joining us today. I think today is really an important day, an important meeting. Um, my background really quickly, I'm Karen Klimmer and I represent Northern California and the Northern, kind of the Pacific Northwest um, of the US. So what brings me to ACES Connection, which I think is relevant to what we're gonna talk about today, is my background is as a public health nurse, specifically looking at maternal child adolescent health populations and seeking to identify systems level change that can help um, improve downstream health outcomes across large populations. 
So as you can see on the screen and as Ingrid has shared previously, we do have many resources and tools on ACES Connection. And our goal is to not reinvent the wheel, to provide these to you. And if you'd like to share what you've developed, we would love to have those on here as well because we can learn from each other and accelerate the ACES science movement, which is really one of our primary goals. So we are hoping that you'll work across sectors and subsectors, and we have some tools for you to determine whether you're able to do that. And as Ingrid said, every voice counts, and we want every, um, everybody represented around the table. Um, if you're just starting out and you're just a handful of people, that's okay. If you're a very large group, that's okay. We just want that to be a concept that you keep in the back of your mind as you work towards your strategic planning. So we're gonna um, move to the next slide. So where are you now? Where do you wanna be and how are we gonna get there? And I really like this simplified version of strategic planning for folks who are just starting out, who maybe have a less, um, a team that has less time and ability or um, availability to work on strategic planning and it might even seem like it's more than you can do. So I wanna to speak to that group specifically because we can always be strategic. We can think about opportunities within our community. Um, even if you're a small group, like who is within your sphere that you can go out and touch and talk to um, at the PTA, at uh, um, with your healthcare provider or wherever that might be. And I'm mentioning this because these can be um, bits of information that can inform your strategic planning. You can have a very robust plan or it, you can have a less robust plan and they're still really helpful. So I will be showing you an example of a plan from another community that shared theirs. It's El Dorado County in California who has an amazing plan, very well laid out. And I want you to also feel if that's not what you can accomplish today, that you still can accomplish something that really helps you identify intersections like justice and education, health and parenting. Also, there's gonna be key stakeholder meetings in your community. So we'll talk more about that as we move forward. But first I would like to share the El Dorado plan with you. And next slide, please. So as you can see from this slide, hopefully you can see, in the, with the colorful boxes, you can see which sectors um, this community, this strategic plan is planning to address. And under each one, you can see this is set up in an Excel spreadsheet with tabs across the bottom. And when you click on each tab, you can see their goal, their objective, and the activities they plan to um, utilize to meet that objective. And this is really helpful, it has a timeline. And what it has is what we call SMART, smart, um, uh, very clear SMART goals. So what we mean by that, SMART is an acronym. <clears throat> it's these goals are specific, they're measurable, achievable, and they're relevant to their work and they're time oriented. So that would be really ideal. Um, and it's something you can also be working towards if you're not quite at that point. But this shows that there's opportunities to leverage those relationships, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you can attend meetings, you can bring, what you really can do is bring your ACEs lens, your trauma-informed understanding, your, in, your um, internal drive to promote resiliency to meetings that are public. Meetings, um, your mental health board meeting, um, your school board meeting your um, just parenting group meetings, all levels of meetings where people gather, many people will find the information around ACE is really relevant and interesting. And because we know so many people are personally impacted by ACEs, it, it resonates as true and that science is so strong that many people that as you speak with them will become interested in, in kind of joining in your effort. I do have to say, starting with the Sonoma County ACEs Connection Group, we were a very small handful of people who met at lunchtime um, just because we were interested. We had full-time jobs, we didn't do other things, and we couldn't, it wasn't part of our work. And eventually it became such a robust group, we had to move to a larger space and it became part of our work as we were able to demonstrate 
the ACEs are really some of the upstream um, factors that were affecting our downstream health priority areas, which is really important. Um, that context that I'm sharing right now was important for our community. So reflecting back within your community, what context might be important um, in your setting, whether it's urban or rural, your small or a large community, um, each of those factors will, will contribute. And there's some other factors that will also contribute to um, setting up your strategic plan. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So I just wanted to share this. This will be my last slide, but what I wanted to provide was additional context, because oftentimes we look at our work just within our local community. And um, I wanted to take you back to like a 30,000 foot level, for example, vision. We have federal agencies and state agencies that put together plans, whether they're the Mental Health Services Act, Maternal Child Adolescent Health, um, funding Title V funds. These are um, organizations, groups, missions, uh, folks who are coming together under these programs that are deciding what they need to do in order to meet their programmatic goals. So when you're aware of what those programmatic goals are, when you speak with them, you can speak about ACEs using the lens of their perspective. So if you're speaking with Mental Health Service Act folks, so their, their emphasis is around behavioral health, then you would bring in information around ACEs as it relates to behavioral health, behavioral health outcomes, et cetera. In maternal child adolescent health, we're really looking at improved birth outcomes and at that, you know, improved health outcomes for children, adolescents, and families. So depending on who you're speaking with, you can bring ACEs into that conversation. And oftentimes, if you have collab, if public health or other governmental agencies are one of your partners, through those conversations, you can oftentimes help over time nudge them so that they write their goals and objectives based on ACEs. So what I'm saying is that they incorporate ACEs constructs and the, and the framework of ACEs trauma resiliency into their problem statements and action plans. And these are really in, um, significant ways to intersect with your community. Another one which I have not put up yet or haven't put up is every nonprofit hospital has to do a community health needs assessment every three years. And if, you, if they oftentimes seek stakeholder input and you'd be an amazing stakeholder to share your thoughts and be part of that discussion, part of any of these discussions and bring your lens to those conversations. And then as they're seeking to prioritize the work that will be happening and funded through um, healthcare foundations, it will have the framework of ACEs ideally built into it. If they're looking at early childhood education and, and head starts, and you can talk about um, the events that lead up to that. So I just wanted to kind of provide that framework, a little bit more framework around that. So as you real strategic plans are really just a roadmap forward um, and how you're going to get there, just as a um, uh, Ingrid said earlier. So the strategic understanding of what influences are in your community can really help as you look at where you are today, where you want to go, and how you're going to get there. Thank you. And next, Alara will explain um, her part. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, and like you said, we're going to move towards tips for organizing an initiative. And so to cover this section, we're going to have Laura Kane, who is our Southern California community facilitator. Hi everyone, I'm Laura Kane. And like Ingrid said, I am responsible for helping communities in Southern California. Um, I have, my background is primarily in education. I've been helping um, schools and districts um, become trauma-informed for quite a long time. And 
more recently in the last couple of years, I've been working with communities um, as an extension of the school. And one of the things I've found, um, a couple of tips I'd like to pass on, I guess, about working um, as a collective that I've learned is to consider having a facilitator. This could be someone that if you have funding that you contract with, or you could find someone that would like to volunteer to play that role. Um, some of the challenges that I've found that groups face um, from a community might be a lack of trust, uh, power differentials or power struggles. Um, they struggle to agree um, on the goals, the mission, the vision, the things that were mentioned earlier in the webinar. Um, and then once they do set out goals, without a facilitator, um, it can be challenging to stick to the priorities that, that the group did, did agree on. The benefits of a facilitator is that you have someone who is that neutral party. There's no, they may not necessarily have a stake in the game. Um, they can keep the group uh, focused. Um, on process so they can lead the group through a lot of different processes that facilitate trust and collaboration um, and they can keep the group focused on the agreed upon goals and kind of keep bringing them back to the center. Um, so from my experience both being part of a group and being the facilitator of groups um, I think it is a very important um, addition especially as your uh, initiative grows. This is a picture of me in uh, Kansas, and we use some visuals, um, which I'm going to go over next, as one, one tool um, to uh, assist your group development. Okay, next slide. So when we worked um, with this community, we used a visual practitioner, someone who um, does visual facilitating. So as and we worked together, so she and I, as we led the group through envisioning their year, those that strategic planning, um, we drew it out. So you can see on the left hand side, they talked about all of the things they had done in the previous year. Um, and in the middle, they brought what strengths they have, that's the what we bring, and then thought about what they might need. What are the gaps that they have? Um, so that then they can really focus on finding the right partners or the right people to fill the gap. Um, and then setting out goals for their next year, um, for the rest of this year. And so again, you know, we helped them, This all of the knowledge was in the room. We were simply just facilitating and drawing out what they already were thinking about and talking about. They just needed support to get it out there and you don't necessarily I mean this is amazing to work with a, a visual um, facilitator or recorder but even if you don't have someone that has those skills you can certainly still record um, all of this in in a way that they can keep it and keep looking back uh, the group can keep referring to it um, and this really helped them come together they every, everyone left feeling like they really um, could agree and had the same that same vision for the year and were on mission together and that meant they were all rowing in the same direction and the when you have a group even if it's a group that's small um, if you're rowing in the same direction you're going to be the most effective group that you can be so that's my two cents from all of my uh, experience in facilitating groups. All right. Questions? Thank you so much, Laura, for contributing to this. Um, now let's talk about any questions that we have from the audience. Also, if you, um, if you want to ask questions, remember, please use the Q&A uh, icon. It should be at the bottom of your of your screen. So use the Q&A as opposed to chat or raising your hand. So our first question is going to Karen. Um, it comes from Karen Dyers uh, and she's asking if um, if anyone on this webinar has been working to incorporate, incorporate ACEs into proclamations for 
April Child Abuse Awareness Month that they could share. Um, Karen, do you have any, Karen Klimmer, do you have anything to add? I think this is a great question and it really links back with our strategic planning and it works across the US. So April is Child Abuse Prevention Month. Many activities are gonna be happening. Thank you, Karen Deers, for the question. Um, and being strategic in incorporating ACEs, and again, it goes back to reframing issues around the construct of ACEs. So child abuse prevention is a really clear linkage. So um, yes, the answer is yes. We have examples of proclamations, and for folks who might not have seen one, um, there are those documents that you could bring to your board of supervisors, your city council, or other political leaders where they will um, recognize either a day, a month, or a moment um, as it relates to the issue you're bringing forward. So um, typically they're written in whereas, whereas, whereas statements. So having somebody that's already put one together is, gives you a really he a nice head start to getting some of the basic con uh, content of what you would write in your proclamation and then you would adapt it for your local community. So yes, we do have examples of proclamations and I'd like to even expand on that just a little bit further if I could. Um, so for anybody that's listening or viewing this webinar, just to consider opportunities such as uh, Prevent Child Abuse Month, which is April, um, as planning ahead and thinking about how you might utilize those naturally occurring events to help move your for action and your work forward. Um, additionally, so for my final point is, um, I'm in Sonoma County, we have a really amazing partner who is a, a co-chair. Um, we Together we established the ACES Connection community. It's called Child Parent Institute, and they lead their local CCAP, uh, C Child, per Child Abuse Prevention um, Group. And so they design and host an event every year and through that ACEs lens, they were able to bring in guest speakers that talked about ACEs. They were able to put together um, publications that bring ACEs into the dialogue as they're talking about the cost of child abuse, the, um, which, would, which we could flip and say the savings we could have with a reduction and how those funds could be used differently if we use them more upstream. So um, yes, there's lots of ways. Proclamation is just one, and we're happy, more than happy, to help you with um, identifying examples that might work well for your community and that are easily adaptable. And one more thing I'd like to say, um, kind of to emphasize like wh what we do as ACES Connection, I love the word connect, because that's what we do, we connect folks and folks that have a community on ACES Connection can share their materials, and we are almost like a conduit. So that is the power of this, um, of our group. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, Karen. This next question is for me. It says, how would mission, mission and vision statements be different for each group? And that is a good question. What you want to think about when it comes to coming up with your mission and vision statement is who do you serve? And so some organizations want to serve children and they're focused specifically on um, children in their area and children's needs. Some are focused on families. And so that would make their mission and, and vision statements different. Uh, and some are focused maybe on the community and then we have some organizations, especially organizations that are a resource or especially around building resiliency or um, helping others to become trauma informed. And they actually serve organizations. And so um, that's gonna be the first um, question to ask when you're coming up with your, with your mission and vision statements. Uh, and so some of us are, when I say us, I'm talking about ACEs initiatives are focused on um, building resiliency or um, we have some that are working with breaking generational curses or intergenerational transmission. Um, we have some that are working on prosperity. And so it's very important to really sit down and think about what you want to accomplish and who you serve when you come up with your mission and um, vision and value statements. And they will be different for each organization. Um, also, let's see. 
We have someone who asked, um, says they have a 501c3, and is there any way to get grant funding to create educational materials for ACES community? Uh, and so there's definitely grant funding out there. I would suggest um, always going to your local community foundations, um, just because they are very much connected to um, the community and know what the community's issues may be. And so every community is different. You may have a community that's really struggling with addiction. And so you can write a grant that, that shows um, research on how adverse childhood experiences impact addiction in adulthood. Um, you may have a, a community that's really struggling with poverty. And so then your grant funding should show how adverse childhood experiences impact uh, poverty rates in your community. And so that is a way to use ACES science to get funding. And like I said, it's always good to start with your um, local community foundations who would have um, more of a connection to the community and know what the community's issues are. Um, next, we're gonna go to Karen. Karen, the question that comes up is, how do I get people to join the community? How to get a meeting set and started? And how to take it from the site to the community? That's a very good question. I love this question, because it's often where people might get a little bit stuck. Like, we're really passionate. I have a passion. My friends have a passion. My colleagues have a passion about this. But how do we move it from that interest and passion to some effective work in our community? And it can really feel very overwhelming. And um, what I can do is share in our community, as I mentioned earlier, um, I just met with somebody uh, and then we had lunch and then we felt just felt so passionate about what we were learning. You just kind of talk about it with your friends and your coworkers and then they become interested and then you just set a lunch date. It's kind of an informal process initially because really it's about relationship building. You have to build those relationships in order to have this really be successful and effective. And it's through those relationships and those folks that are within your group as they go out and connect with people within their sphere of influence that things start to move. Um, so I would encourage for somebody who's on their own, they're very interested, um, reach out to your community facilitator and let us try to help you, help put you in contact with somebody else already in your area. And we can help you with that by doing um, searches by zip codes and other things and help putting people together. And of course, as Ingrid mentioned earlier, we're really seeking and um, striving to grow the number of ACES connection communities. So if it makes sense, um, your community facilitator could help you do that. And that can be a place where you start. I know for some geographic communities, um, so in some parts, of, especially in Northern California, it's very difficult to go from point A to point B. You know, there could be mudslides, there are windy mountainous roads, uh, weather is a big factor. It could be four hours to go from one small town to the other in order to have an in-person meeting. So what ACES Connection um, online community provides is a way to have those conversations. And unlike a regular website, when you have your own community, you can interact, you get to share materials, you can ask questions. So it's more of an interactive opportunity versus just a place to store information. Um, in addition, of course, we provide a lot of resources as we mentioned earlier. So I would encourage anybody who's interested to reach out to your community facilitator um, for some support, but also reflect on who do you know? Who do you run into regularly? Who do you have um, conversations with and how might you bring ACEs and the ACEs construct or framework into conversations with them in, in a way that would make sense from their perspective. Um, so I hope this was helpful. And um, if you need additional support, again, reach out to your community facilitator and we'll be sharing who those folks are at the end of the video. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Let's see, our next question is going to be for Laura. And so, Laura, they're asking for you to share examples or stories about navigating through challenges um, with coalitions. That's a great question. Um, I would say that the power of group development can't be understated or underestimated. So 
for example, I uh, was part of a group that was facilitating a group process in P Pittsburgh, and there had been a lot of false starts before um, in this kind of community organizing effort, and there was a lot of mistrust. And before we could dive into what you might think of as getting the work done, we had to spend several months just building the group, the group identity, um, building trust, doing activities that built community and trust and psychological safety within the group. So we, we call it, you have to go slow to go fast. So we, with any of the groups where I've experienced these kind, even if, whether they're major challenges or minor challenges or a bunch of people who don't know each other and are just trying to come together around this common interest, it's all the same foundation of, of building solid group development and trust and um, collaboration and psychological safety through different kinds of activities that groups can engage in. And you don't have to have a professional facilitator. It certainly helps, especially with someone who knows how to develop a group, but a group can look up online. How do we, you know, how, what are activities that promote trust and collaboration amongst groups? And they'll, there's a lot out there. You could learn how to do this, even if you're a small group without a facilitator, but I, I can't understate how, um, how important it is to, to build that kind of trust and, and collaboration within a group before you dive into the actual work. That's Thank you. Thank you, Laura. That is very true. And just to add to that, um, as a, a part of a collective impact, we definitely had to go through that process. And it is very important to um, take the time to do that because ultimately you're, especially your steering group or your steering committee, they should be reflective of the community, which means there should be lots of different types and diversity on your committee, which means not everyone is going to know each other. And so you should definitely make sure that you go through the process of creating trust as you um, get started in your initiative. That should be kind of the first thing. And a lot of times people get started in their initiative and then they have to, they have to backtrack and go back and do those things later because they, they need them. Um, so let's go to our next question. Um, let's see, this is for Karen. Can ACES communities be online, nationwide, focus on a specific issue? That's a good question. Sure, so um, we have multiple, as, as you are probably aware, if you've joined ACES Connection, if you haven't, please do so. Um, we have our main site, which is our ACES connection and all the resources such as Ingrid was presenting to you. And underneath that large umbrella, we have communities. These communities could be interest-based, organizational, or geographic. So I think what you're describing is an interest-based community. And examples that we have that are really robust are parenting in ACES. Imagine um, having lived through ACES as a child, you become an adult, become a parent, and how triggering that could be and the extra support that would be really helpful in order to be the best parent you want you can so yes we do have um, um, interest-based groups we have uh, aces in education aces in maternal mental health um, aces in juvenile justice and aces in higher education i'm just rolling a few off the top of my head um, but i would want to just have one caution um, it's really great to have these specific interests, but whenever there's an opportunity to present something that would really have substantial um, positive influence for the whole ACES um, online community, which is almost 30,000 people, to have that information, oftentimes it's really great to share it on our main page or, and uh, make a blog. Um, and a blog is really just something that you post, it's a story, it can be simple or complicated, it could be as simple as like a Facebook post where you're sharing a thought, maybe connecting it with an image or a resource. So um, I know I give you a really kind of long roundabout way. So yes is the answer. And there's some other factors that we'd want to consider to ensure that um, those who may not be aware of that issue or that topic also have, um, um, can be informed by the conversations that are happening around it. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Karen. So let's actually go onto the site and look at an interest-based community. So let's see. So if you're navigating from the home page, you see all of the different um, links on the dashboard. Community is the second one. If you click on communities, it'll automatically go to all communities and then you'll have a listing of all of the communities by alphabet. If you want, you can change it by community size, but sorting alphabetically is probably the best way. Um, Here's our first interest-based community, ACEs and Nourishment. And so this is going to have information about nutrition uh, and good eating habits and how they relate to adverse childhood experiences. One of our most popular communities is going to be uh, Parenting with ACEs. Let's see. We also have ACEs in education, ACEs in foster care, ACEs in higher education. And so if you want to know what communities we have to include those interest-based communities, Go up to your dashboard and click on the communities link. And then they will all show in alphabetical order. Okay. So we do have a few more questions. One question that comes is, can you suggest a general list of partners involved in ACES collaboratives? And so you can also find partners through the groups that we have established under that communities link, but I can tell you that they differ from area to area. So let me tell you what we have in Tennessee. Um, here in Tennessee, our partners are um, our health department, your local health department. So Nashville's Davidson County Health Department is one of our partners. Um, we have Prevent Child Abuse Tennessee as a partner. Um, we have the YWCA and the YMCA as partners. We also have smaller nonprofits as partners, especially those who um, are focused on parents and parent education. Um, here we also have, um, let's see, Big Brothers, Big Sisters as partners. And so you really will find that most of the partnerships are going to be social services types of agencies and, and nonprofits. Uh, and, but one thing that you'll find a lot of communities, especially in, in, it's in ours and in most communities, is that we have a hard time making that leap into the for-profit and corporate um, organizations um, outside of maybe sponsorship. So we may have a corporate sponsor for an event, but not so much involved in becoming trauma-informed or um, making sure that their employees are uh, ACE aware. And so that is something that you may want to focus, especially when you're doing your strategic plan, to make sure that you are involving uh, people outside of the service, of the social services industries. Let's see, and Karen, do you want to add to that, to that question, the answer to that question? Yes, I would, Ingrid, I'd, I'd like to um, just weigh in a little bit. So um, what we learned when we were putting together our local ACEs Connection group and becoming more formalized was the importance and the value of, of having every voice at the table, especially marginalized people um, folks who may 
not typically feel that their voice um, matters as much because it's really important that folks who are impacted the most have at least an equal voice, if not greater. Organizations um, will be able to partner and do great work and key ACES champions within those organizations are, are great. That work really needs to be informed by people impacted by ACES. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that we don't forget that each voice matters. Everybody has a seat at the table and around our table, everybody was equal, whether they're CEO or somebody coming from somewhere else, whatever their role, we were all equal people working together to address this issue that impacted our whole community and often impacted those who were most marginalized the most. Thanks for letting me just add my two cents. Okay, and let's take um, one last question. This is also for Karen. It says, any social services in counties that are aware of ACEs? Um, Karen, what do you think about that question? So social services, uh, especially county-based, that are aware of, of ACEs? I love this question. I love it more than I can say. So, um, so we're a nation. And wherever you're sitting, you're in a state and you're in that state's a specific region or county. So we're all a little different in how we are with our lens. But what we do have in common are child welfare rules or um, uh, work around um, reducing food insecurity or making sure folks are sheltered. And often all of these folks really are impacted by ACEs and oftentimes those ACEs can cross into the next generation. So there's a lot of upstream benefits, financial and otherwise, in addressing these. So um, that is a really long way of saying yes. Many, many um, social service programs like um, WIC, Women, Infant, Children, um, uh, uh, we, we call Family, Youth and Children Services, which would be uh, child welfare, um, public health, home visiting, um, many, many do are aware of ACEs and the impact of ACEs on the population they're serving. What becomes more challenging is how do they operationalize that knowledge into their work? And how do they help that new knowledge um, influence the culture within their workforce? Because we can imagine that when we talk about trauma, these people are working in jobs oftentimes that experience tremendous secondary trauma. They are often driven to do this work because of their passion. And through this work, they could experience the trauma of having to work in really difficult situations. So um, I think it's a multi-tiered response. And the answer is a resounding yes. We have lots of models across the nation and in different states. And we would love to share those with you. And if you don't have, if that's not happening in your county or your community, please reach out to your community facilitator to see if there's some models that that person may share with you to help open that discussion or to frame it in a context that makes sense to the work that's being done within that social service agency. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Karen. And we have one last question before I show you the resources um, for contacting your uh, community facilitator. And that is, will the new cooperative model affect what is currently being offered for free? And so I wanted to make sure that I address that before we end this webinar. So we have the new cooperative model coming, but you can definitely keep the services that you presently have access to for free. And so the cooperative model will bring in new services um, that are not currently available. So we will um, continue to have the free services for communities that we have now. The cooperative model will bring in additional services. And then we will roll out information on how to register for the cooperative. Um, and this uh, information will be available through the regional um, community facilitator. Um, so there were a lot of questions that I, were not, I was not able to get to today. Those questions will be provided um, through the sign up. So I will make sure I will email, email out any resources 
um, to address the questions that were asked today. So I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, again, we talked before about our call to action. We would love for all members to either be a member of an online community or to start their own online community. Um, and so we want to make sure that everyone is aware of who their community facilitators are. So we have Gail Kennedy and she is in charge of Western States and Central California. Myself, I have Tennessee and the Midwest. We have Sissy White, who has Northeast. We have Carrie Sipp, who covers the Southeast. Uh, Karen Klimmer, who is here with us today. She's Northwest and Northern California. We have Danielle Prince, who covers San Francisco Bay Area, California. And we have Laura Kane, who is also here with us today, covering Southern California. So if you are interested in starting your own local initiative, please contact us at the email that we have displayed. Um, also, be sure if you are not currently a member to go in and join ACES Connection at acesconnection.com. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great rest of the day.